Hello, and thank you for joining today. My name is Anya Kaplan, and I'm head of operations and events for the Fashion Scholarship Fund. Before we dive in, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. As many of us at this point are very familiar with Zoom, there are some great features that we encourage you to use. One of those features is the Q&A box. Feel free to send in your questions and we'll answer as many as possible during the Q&A segment of the discussion. And now I would like to introduce our executive director, Peter Arnold. Thank you, Anya. Welcome everybody who's joining today uh, for the latest in a series of summer scholar sessions that we have, as you know, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Today's is uh, captioned lunch break with the bosses. Um, back in the day, we had an event called uh, Breakfast with a Boss, which was for those uh, scholars who were interning in New York. Uh, we've pivoted a bit and I think probably more effectively are able um, virtually to reach a far number of scholars, scholar applicants and alumni and have not just a boss, but several bosses. Uh, and I'm very pleased today to introduce our four powerhouse executives bosses and industry leaders. Um, Jim Kirshner, friend and president of the New York-based clothing brand, Cool. Welcome, Jim. Thank you. Uh, Jim is joined by Hildy Couric, who's a co-founder of the strategic consultancy Artemis Strategies. And Hildy is also an external policy advisor for Condé Nast and Vogue. Welcome, Hildy. Um, Hildy and Jim are joined by Morgan Richardson. Morgan is the president of the Americas at La Perla. Welcome, Morgan. And our moderator today is Jennifer Vecchio, who is the FSF's board president. And that means she's putatively and actually my boss. So, uh, <laughs> but during the day, Jennifer is the president and chief merchandising officer at Burlington Stores. So thanks, Jennifer, for agreeing to moderate. And I'm going to turn this over to you. Okay, great. Well, welcome, everyone. We're so excited to have you. A big thank you to Anya and Peter for putting this together. And a, and a, a big thank you to our uh, panelists, Morgan, Hildy, and Jim. Thank you for participating. I know this is a really meaningful session for um, all of our students to really get to understand what, what goes on in the real world. Um, so we have a lot to cover today. So I, I think we'll dive right in. Um, so I'm going to start with a question or a series of questions for all, all three of you. Um, you've had deep expertise in, in many different aspects of the fashion industry. Um, and I think our students, scholars and young professionals uh, are eager to hear your, your perspectives. So let's, let's go back to the early stages of your careers. Um, think back to the time when you were in a similar place to where our scholars are, are today. And um, if you could touch on, you know, telling us about your current position and what your roles entail, uh, what you did first, uh, you know, sorry, when did you first know what you wanted to work in, what you wanted to work in fashion? Can you tell us about your journey after college, how you, how you landed that first job, having two kids who just graduated from college? I'm very interested to hear your perspectives as well. Um, what were some of the defining lessons from those early experiences and who, you know, were some of the influential mentors who helped you along the way? I think, you know, often those can be some of the most meaningful things in, in many of our careers. Um, so with that, uh, Morgan, you want to kick us off? Happy to. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Morgan Richardson. Uh, in my role as president of the Americas region for La Perla, I oversee finance, HR, merchandising, retail, marketing, and wholesale for North and South America. Um, we have five retail stores in the country, over 80 points of distribution uh, with our wholesale partners and a website. Um, and my responsibility is to manage the PL. Uh, the profit and loss, uh, and ensure the region's operations achieve our targets and maximize sales and profit. Uh, so my role is equally quantitative uh, as it is qualitative relationship management, both internally and externally. Um, my first career aspiration was actually to dance with the New York City Ballet. I trained at the School of American Ballet at Lincoln Center uh, for most of my adolescence and managed a professional schedule 
dancing up to seven hours a day throughout high school. Um, when I was injured at age 17, I decided to leave dance. Um, I applied to one school and went to Harvard where I studied social anthropology um, and spent my summers interning in fashion. Uh, what I've always loved the most about fashion is it's something personal. Um, I chose fashion because it really marries business with a form of expression. Um, there's some element of the power of choice when you get to decide what you wear and what you personally feel good in. Um, and it appealed to me to be in a business that produces merchandise to make people feel good. Um, so there, there are so many special moments, um, special life moments that we can create with retail, uh, whether it's the memory of choosing your outfit for the first day of elementary school that you share with your mother in a store, or trying on a beautiful bridal gown surrounded by your family. Uh, there are so many life moments that have to do with retail. And that was appealing to me to be a part of. Um, so in terms of my path, how I landed my first job, I interviewed for Bloomingdale's executive development program um, right after undergrad, because I felt that buying was the perfect entry point into the business to give me exposure um, to several businesses, small brands, large brands, contemporary brands, luxury brands. Um, buying and merchandising also has an entrepreneurial aspect because as a buyer, you manage all aspects of the brand at the department store, uh, from the merchandise selection process to the way the brands are marketed within the department store and so forth. Um, so my first job within the program was an assistant buyer in Children's Square. Um, and I worked extremely hard and had wonderful support from the management at Bloomingdale's uh, who promoted me each year until I arrived at a buyer role overseeing the designer ready to wear collections at Bloomingdale's. Um, after that, I went to Barney's as a senior executive buyer overseeing the buying team of about nine buyers and over 180 brands. Um, and from there, uh, I moved on to the brand side um, at Oscar de la Renta, where I oversaw product development and merchandising as the vice president. And then La Perla found me and approached me for this role in the fall of 2019. I joined in January, 2020, um, and it's been a super dynamic journey since then over the past two and a half years. Um, in terms of uh, some lessons from the early experiences, I have to say one lesson the CEO of Bloomingdale's always emphasized was how you make other people feel. Uh, he put great importance on the relationship management side of the business and ended every single meeting with these words. These are all just numbers. We're up one month, we're down the next, but no matter what, no one's going to remember the numbers, but they'll remember how you make them feel. As a result, uh, the environment he created was a company that really cared about people. And to this day, the six years I spent at Bloomingdale's was truly one of my favorite and most impactful experiences because it was an environment of great people with great respect for one another um, and therefore super collaborative, which ultimately also brought the best out of everyone and great results. Um, since then, I'd say uh, really every boss at Bloomingdale's was a truly influential mentor. Um, they integrated me into several senior executive meetings as early as my first role as an assistant buyer. Um, and whether it was just the opportunity to sit in on a meeting next to my buyer and hear conversations at a senior level, or my senior vice president sharing one of my strategies with the CEO, every person I worked for there was very supportive and served as a mentor. Um, so I would just say along my path, one of the most important parts was having wonderful people with integrity around me. Um, and I think that's everything because you can't create success single-handedly. It really comes from a team. So that's my path and some of my advice, which I hope is helpful to you. Uh, I'll pass it on to Hildy. Oh, well, thank you. Thanks, Morgan. Uh, that was really interesting to hear. I'm Hildy Kurek. It's great to be here. Thank you guys, Anya and Peter, Jennifer, for having me. Um, I'm, I sort of feel, I have to admit, a little bit like an imposter in this group um, because, 
you know, I'm looking at these, you know, when did I first know I wanted to work in fashion? Um, I have, I didn't, I came to fashion pretty late in my career. Um, I spent the first half of my career in professional politics. I worked in the White House, I interned there, and then I worked there right after college and spent most of my career after that in on the political side as a fundraiser and kind of worked my way through presidential campaigns and Senate campaigns and had my own business. So it's sort of crazy. I didn't come to fashion until I was in my 30s, which for me, I think was really great to kind of come in at that moment. So um, I'll give you my current position and my role, and then I'll go back and tell you when I, you know, kind of first came to fashion. But um, I am the co-founder uh, of a boutique strategy firm called Artemis Strategies. Um, along with our team, we help brands, founders, uh, CEOs distill, articulate, and bring their values to life with a goal of connecting with their desired audience, whoever that audience is, whether that's internal or external or investors or consumers uh, through brands. Because as you, we believe, and I think the data bears out that when you lead with your values, you do better. You create that better culture that Morgan was talking about. You really connect authentically with the people you're trying to reach and it just, you know, happier employees make ha better returns and better companies and, you know, happier customers, of course. So we love that work. We do that and we're kind of sector agnostic. We work in tech and we work in startups and we work in fashion as well. The other side of my coin, I would say, is I am an external policy advisor to Condé Nast and Vogue. Uh, for five years, I was the communications director there. And then I transitioned to a consulting role and I still work. Um, I really love the work I do, actually. I work across all the brands uh, with Anna and with other senior leaders, with the head of public pol global public policy to make sure that we Condé continues to live their values. Uh, they have made have a long history of supporting various causes, but how do we make sure that they're working toward their goals, both through sustainability, which they've gone, you know, pretty transparent about their targets um, and what they can do, as well as diversity and inclusion. So I love that work and we can talk more about it if you want, but, um, you know, it sort of spans voter registration drives to uh, creating, we created a wonderful younger than you guys, but we, we are wrapping up the program for this year, a high school mentorship and enrichment program that's piloting in New York with 12 juniors from various um, underserved communities across New York who are getting basically a year-long masterclass across all the creative arts at Condé Nast taught by the experts at Condé Nast, and they'll go on stay with us for their senior year where, they're, where, where they'll pick their major. So it's been pretty exciting. All right. So when did I want to work in fashion? I say when Anna Wintour asked me, which I know <laughs> sounds crazy, but I had met her when working on the Obama campaign in 2007. And I don't, can't tell you why, but we clicked. Um, and I worked with her throughout that whole campaign, was sort of her point person. And then when we won and went to DC and continued to cultivate that relationship. And when we left in 2012, I was the finance director of the DNC and was very burnt out and moved home with my two-year-old and my husband back to New York. And she was like my first call. And I went and saw her and I told her I wanted to go work in finance because I thought that's what I needed to do. And she was said, you're going to find that boring. And I said, I am not. And, you know, lo and behold, three, you know, in my head, it was three weeks, but it was probably a, you know, a month and a half later, I called her and I said, you were right, it was boring. You know, we need to talk again. And she asked me to apply for this job in her office, which I knew was open as comms director, but I have to be honest, I had never done comms before and I had never worked in fashion. I'd never talked to a reporter before, which is crazy. Um, and I have really funny stories about that if anyone wants to hear. But so I went in and applied, but she said, I know what you don't know but I know you and I trust you and we'll teach you the rest and it'll either work or not work. And that was incredible. So I did, I jumped into the deep end of fashion's pool. And, you know, for the first six months, I say I really wanted to, I felt nauseous every single day. And then you just, I kept swimming and I, you know, and I loved it. So I think that was sort of, and we can talk more about why I loved fashion, but being in the center of it, seeing the power to make change, not only that Anna has and that Vogue had, but really that fashion has, as Morgan said, clothes and fashion express who you are. 
and they register the culture at that time and our time. And I think that as someone who loves policy, who loves history, who loves legacy, like that's an incredible place to be. So I felt very lucky about that. Um, after college, how I landed my first job is sort of boring. I interned at the White House and then I was very, very lucky that the office I interned in, which is the Office of Legislative Affairs, which is basically watching a lot of C-SPAN and monitoring what uh, is happening on the Hill for the president's team was hiring and they hired a lot of interns. And so I was, you know, worked like crazy during my internship. And I'm sure not dissimilar to many other experiences when you work like crazy and you have a great attitude and, you know, you show up and the first, first one there, last one to leave and do whatever is asked of you, you know, you know, if you have the right team, you get noticed. And I was lucky there was an opening and they hired me. So that was my first job. Um, the dis what are the defining lessons I guess I learned from those experiences is something that I've, and then this one's really from fundraising because I transitioned, as I said, after the Clinton administration ended in 2000 into political fundraising. I learned the art of asking for things. And I think that's really been something that's stayed with me. And I think a really good lesson um, because in fundraising, you have, to ask, you have to ask people for money. And, you know, but you, it, people feel intimidated by that. But I quickly came to realize I'm not asking for me. I'm not asking Jim to give me $200,000. I'm asking people to support candidates or issues or causes that I believe in and that I will hope that they believe in as well. And if they say no, that's okay. It's not personal. And that's sort of the other lesson I think I've really carried with me. It's not personal. It doesn't mean you shouldn't put your passion into your job, but you have to find a way to separate your personal feelings from your work experience. Because if you, the more you wrap it up, the harder it is to step back and sort of see the whole field and, and be dispassionate when making decisions or when thinking about other people's motivations or trying to figure out where you fit into the organization. So I would say the art of saying no led to it not being personal. I mean, the art of asking for something led to the, you know, it not being personal. And then I would say, um, I really learned that like, you know, surround yourself with people you enjoy being with every day. And, you know, Anna says this a lot and actually I totally agree with it. You know, she says she surrounds herself with the people she really enjoys seeing, even if they don't on paper have the role, the resume or the role, you know, experience that you would think. Because if they're smart and they're great and, you know, they have a great attitude and they're willing to learn, that sort of, she believes, and I, I've had that experience too and people I've hired that nine times out of 10, it really works out. So I think the mentors, obviously Anna is definitely one of them. I would say I had some really early bosses in, in politics who sat down with me as a young person and were very honest, and this is all bleeding into other questions, but about you know my writing skills, giving me critical feedback about what showing up meant uh, in terms of my uh, presentations, how you know I was sloppy. So how do you, you know, like in terms of grammar or in terms of writing and thinking through and not rushing. And they really taught me that. So I think that hopefully that answers your questions. Um, Jim, I'll turn it over to you. Wow, what an act to follow. <laughs> I feel like there's a masterclass yeah. in how to answer yeah. those very <laughs> meaty questions in like such a succinct way. Well, I hope I can live up to that. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for, for having me here. My name is Jim Kirshner, and I am the president of Cule, which is uh, an American fashion brand um, based in New York City. Um, and we make classic clothes with the happy wink. So when I joined the brand back in 2015, uh, I joined Nikki Cule, who's the founder and the, the namesake. Um, and I became her early business partner. It was just the two of us, um, starting with a line of striped t-shirts um, and a couple of fun accessories. And over the last seven years, we have built a business that encapsulates many, many product categories um, and sells stores like Bergdorf Goodman and Bloomingdale's and Shop Bop and Lane Crawford, um, as well as uh, a very strong business online, which is about 70% of our business. Um, and we also have a store in Rockefeller Center, um, a store in Cobble Hill, Brooklyn, and we're about to open another store in Montecito, just outside of LA. 
So it's been a really fun experience, truly building a brand from nothing. Um, what I've loved about that experience is, um, you know, as everyone has said on this call, like fashion touches so many different aspects of your daily life. Um, and it's also something that's both analytical and creative. So like really being at the, the juncture or the, where those two things meet is like such an exciting place for me. I've always loved, um, loved that connection point. So doing everything from finance and sales, marketing, HR, operations, supply chain, it all falls under me except for some like big picture branding things. And of course, design coming from Nikki, who is a creative powerhouse. Um, not to get ahead to my piece of advice, but working for incredibly creative people is a very rewarding thing. And just while I'm talking about Nikki and that founder relationship, want to throw that out there. Um, that's been one of the um, great joys of my career is working with super creative people. Um, and it also like reiterates what, what Morgan and Hildy have also said, this whole business and in my opinion, life in general is all about the people you surround yourself with and like finding those people is super important. Um, similar to, I guess, both of you, um, I didn't start like studying fashion um, right away. I actually was a music major at NYU. I thought I wanted to work in the music industry. Um, but during um, my four years there, I did a lot of internships. One of the beauties of going to school in New York is that you can do internships all the time. And I learned that I hated the music industry. So it was a very fast way to learn what I did not like. Um, and I guess I just, I fell into fashion and that sounds very New York kismet, but it's true. I was out at a party at the Met and met someone who needed someone to help do freelance PR and work in her store um, in the meatpacking district. And I started working part-time and then interning um, in PR, which got me to my first job in sales at Carolina Herrera, where I spent um, my first two years out of undergrad. That experience was so incredible for me because um, I think working for a smaller company really allows you to see the entire puzzle and how, how all of the different pieces fit together, um, which has served me incredibly well um, in my current role as the president of a business. Um, just for some context, Carolina Herrera is a huge global business, but the collection business is much smaller, with a much smaller team. Um, also, for me, it was really important to work in the, like, the epicenter of the business, like, at the true headquarters, like, understanding where all of the decisions were made versus being dictated to from a global office um, elsewhere um, was really interesting just, you know, to be where, in the room where it happens, as they say. Um, I loved that exposure and the way that you could uh, meet like the true decision makers across all aspects of the business. Um, but after a couple of years, I felt a little um, like I was not, I needed, I needed some more challenges. So I went to, to business school um, and I spent my first year exploring every opportunity outside of fashion, thinking I wanted to see the world and see what else was out there. And the more I looked around, the more I confirmed my decision that fashion was actually a great place for me. Um, as I said already, I love that mix of the qualitative and the quantitative. I'm super interested in consumer behavior. Um, and I just love that it's such a complex industry. Um, it's not an easy one, but I think that's what makes it so interesting to work in day to day. Like these businesses are huge. And I think there are times when um, some, you know, people in finance or other very like stodgy industries raise their nose at the fashion industry, but it's one of the most complex supply chain, largest, most impactful industries in the world. And so to be a part of that and to grow and work in those organizations is something that um, I've found so, so fulfilling. Um, so yeah, I went to business school. I ended up interning at Bonobos when it was a much smaller business, um, still a scrappy startup, pre-Walmart days. Um, and from there, I worked for Inditex, the parent company of Zara. And I was working on in-store operations and RFID technology. At the time, I was looking for some international exposure and also coming from smaller businesses, I wanted that like big business experience under my belt. 
Um, so when I was looking for my next job out of business school, I, I kind of had a, a checklist of like, these are the things I really needed to, to get out of that next experience. Um, and Zara was that fit for me. It's an incredible organization and they do so many things so well. Um, but culturally, it was not a great fit for me. Um, it's not very entrepreneurial. It's very much um, an organization um, where decisions are made in La Coruña in Spain and sent out to the stores to implement. Um, and I mean, that's why in many ways, that's why they're so successful, but just as a, um, as a worker, that, is, that was not the vibe that I was going for. So I think it's really important in your career to understand that even if the business looks great on paper and you know, the pay is great and, you know, everything sounds like it's perfect. If it's not feeling good for you, you don't have to, you know, dedicate your entire career to a business that doesn't, doesn't feel right. So after two years, um, I left and joined Nikki in this, at the time was a very small startup, still is a small startup, but much larger now. Um, so yeah, going from the world's largest apparel retailer to uh, a two-person startup was quite a, uh, a jarring experience, but one that ultimately was was super fulfilling. Um, what else? What are the questions we got here? Um, I think I went through most things. Oh, defining lessons. I would just say um, everyone else has mentioned this already, but it's all about the people and being nice to everyone. It's a very small industry, so you never want to build a bridge in any relationship that you're doing. And even the small things can be remembered so many years later. Um, Hildy, it's it's great that you have this Anna connection because I actually have a very early Anna memory from my days interning at Nina Ricci. I was holding the door open for every editor who came in for press appointments. And one of the only people the entire day who said thank you for opening the door was Anna. And like that has stuck with me so many years later. Oh, she's so polite. I know. It's like something people don't know about her. Yeah, and, and it's such a simple thing, but like, like I'm getting chills just thinking about like, oh my gosh, Anna Wintour, I was, you know, 18 years old. It was the, like, that's why I wanted to still live in this, you know, to work in this industry. And it's those little things that like really mean a lot to people and will stick with you. Um, so surround yourself with, with good people and, um, and good things happen. So, yeah. All right. Well, Jim, there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. So Jim, let's just stay with you for a moment. So, you know, I know you focused on bringing uh, new technology to retail. Uh, in your career, um, specifically the RFID wireless tags and readers um, to to Zara. So how did that how did that um, innovation impact Zara's business globally? And what do you see as the next new technological innovation for retail? Yeah, for sure. So what Zara is really good at understanding is what like the trade offs that they're making in every single decision across their business. So like they manufacture a lot of their clothing very close to Spain where their distribution centers are so they can, um, you know, so they can turn product around really quickly. They're known for having new product all the time. They're air freighting goods. They know that it means that's very expensive, but they can get it to the store faster and they can take less inventory risk. So with RFID, they were, they were seeing that they're not so good at customer service in the store. I'm sure some of you have had some Zara experiences where you're waiting in a long line or you can't find someone um, to find the product for you. They're, they're sold out of your size on the selling floor, even if they might have that in the back, back of house. So with RFID, they were able to know how many of a given piece were supposed to be on the sales floor at all times and truly tracking from the back of house to the front of house and pushing product to consumers as quickly as possible. So all, all sizes were always available and it was more of like a help yourself kind of model versus having to wait to find someone to help you to, to get that inventory. So what it did was reduced stockouts on the floor by something like 25% across the business, um, which obviously has a huge impact on sales. Um, it also just created incredible visibility across stores from the distribution center um, and allowed stores to be much more strategic with their replenishment. So they would know, did I give this product um, a valid opportunity to be sold or was it that we sold out of the first size run really quickly and then no one replenished it for a week. And so that's why the sales weren't so good. Um, so it was a really incredible tool just to get access into what was happening in the store. 
Um, the one thing I'll say about in-store technology is that it's only as good as the team that is managing it. So we were able to unsurf or to uh, uncover a lot of in-store issues that had been hidden um, before, you know, before we saw all of these reports. Um, but it didn't fundamentally change which stores operated at a high level and which stores mm -hmm. didn't. So the great stores performed even better, and the you know the C and D stores had issues <laughs> and like you just saw everything like we just turned crank the volume up and we saw in stark relief um the differences between the different management teams going back to our lessons about people great people can run great stores with or without great technology but giving them the tools obviously makes it um much better in terms of what's coming next um i i actually think it's a lot of the not very sexy stuff that we've been talking about for 10 years, which is a single um, view of a customer across channels, like getting even better at omni-channel inventory management. I know it's not a, a new topic. We've been talking about this for a long time, but so many brands still don't have a good grasp on that customer across different points of the journey. Um, and being able to walk into a store and like bring up that customer's order history and talk them through, um, you know, like what items they can layer on into their closet or like give that like true client telling experience. I think at least in a like boutique um, location has is something that's really interesting for us as a brand and something that we're definitely leaning into. Um, retail in in our business and many businesses is all about that experience and the the brand building that comes comes along with it um there's a lot of transaction that can happen on the web so as soon as you get someone who's actually in front of you um creating a very like global vision of what the brand can be with as much data um in a non-salesy way that you have uh is is like mission critical you only have one opportunity to really to grasp them so yeah. having all the tools in your hands to to make that experience wonderful is is really important great thank you jim mm -hmm. uh so uh, hilda you've had obviously a less straightforward path into working in the fashion industry <laughs> so tell us a little bit about how the skills you honed working in politics uh helped you navigate the fashion world and then you know love to hear what are some of the skills that were that you found to be unique to the fashion world um, sure. Um, I think, you know, hard work is certainly can across many fields, but certainly both in politics and in fashion. I think there's like a, a really a similarity of passionate people sprinting toward a goal is sort of how I think about it. Like I feel in fashion and in the industry overall, like people are so passionate, you, you're so creative. And they really believe you have to believe in what you're doing and, and you're in it, whether you're on the buy side or you're on the creative side or wherever you are. And, and that's true in politics. I think people are obviously very passionate and, you know, especially campaigns, I would say, which is what, you know, how I sort of ended my career in politics on a campaign. You're no matter where you are in the campaign, you're all sort of sprinting toward a goal and, and working on a very large team but playing your individual role. And so I think those were things that I felt, um, you know, I sort of stepped in and understood that. Um, some of the smartest people I said, I really feel lucky I went to Vogue. I felt like, you know, I went from working in the Obama world and, you know, with some of the most incredibly talented individuals to working at Vogue where I felt like people were at the top of their game. And I got to learn from the true, sort of leaders and, and folks I had looked up to and, and got to sit with them and ask them questions and understand this world through their eyes. So that was really, really an honor for me. And I felt very lucky to do that. Um, I would also say one other thing that I don't think I fully grasped about when I came into the industry that what I would really love is, you know, akin to my work um, in government and policy Vogue, but also the industry as a whole, really believes that we're only as healthy as all of us collectively as an industry. So we there's such a long track record of you know people across this industry stepping in and supporting each other. And I think you know obviously before my time, but you know fashion industry and Vogue have a long history. You know especially back when AIDS was coming, you know was really devastating the industry as a whole, creating Fashions Night Out in the 90s to galvanize people and to talk about something that no one, it's hard to believe, but like people were not talking about then, but had devastated so much of the creative community. Um, 
uh, sorry, seventh on sale to fashion's night out after the recession when no one was shopping and, you know, Vogue partnered with the city and with retailers, you know, and stores and brands to bring people out into the streets and created a party. I remember I came, when I came to Vogue in 2013, they were still global fashions night out happening around the world, which was amazing. And to the CFDA Vogue Fashion Fund that happened after 9-11, um, which you know has a rich history of incubating and supporting some of fashion's um, you know biggest stars, if you want to call it that, or most successful designers. And then even more recently, um, which I'm very proud to have played a role in, is the creation of a common thread right after the pandemic, when we knew businesses were being devastated and shuttered, and um, we worked with the CFDA to sort of transition the fashion fund raise a bunch of money really quickly and give out micro grants to businesses and really focus the focus of a common thread was to say it's not just the faces you know there are so many people behind the scenes you know the cutters and the manufacturers and the you know the designers um you know buyers and all of retail it was just there's so many people that go into making what you're wearing or where you know creating this industry and we wanted to shine a light on them so that was really incredible. And then the way that we can create um, an initiative like that and get it off the ground so quickly, but also then obviously show it and uh, highlight it also through our editorial. So that was really important. I would say one of the skills fashion has taught me, certainly be nice and be polite. And um, you know, I'd like to think I was a polite person before this, but I think politics sort of can make you a little gruff or crazy. And I feel like, you know, coming back to fashion, coming to fashion really brought me back to my roots as a really, you know, write a thank you note, a hand note, you know, make sure you ask people how they are, you know, make your emails personable. I think that was a feedback someone gave me that my emails were too gruff. When I first started, I would just be like, you know, Jim, what are we doing? Da, 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 da. And, or I wouldn't even say Jim, I would just say, what are we doing with this? And people would, you know, I have to be nice. So, you know, if you want to really engage people, people are put off by that, which I totally understand and is correct. So, you know, really create taking that moment to write something a little more formal, a little more, a little more put together, and a, definitely more polite. So, I think that's there are a lot of actual things, a lot of uh, similarities, I would say, which I was really happy to see. Okay, great, thank you. I think I think we've all learned some of those uh, those lessons about how important it is how you how you treat people and how people you know hear you. Um, so Morgan, um, obviously the luxury retail business is very dynamic and and complex, and I think we have quite a few members of our audience who are specifically interested in this sector uh, of the industry. So what are some of the ways that you've seen luxury transform uh, over the last few years? Mm -hmm. uh what I have loved observing in the luxury space right now are the new interpretations of luxury. Um, you know, one definition of luxury is the state of comfort, which means luxury can really mean something different to every person. Uh, COVID certainly put luxury into perspective. Um, a peaceful evening at home with your family is truly a luxury that one might have taken for granted before. Um, so I think you know, luxury fashion is certainly about providing the customer with comfort, but also it provides the customer with innovation and something unexpected. And I say that because over the past couple of years in particular, we're seeing all of these terrific and unexpected collaborations emerge between brands, as well as between new designers and heritage brands. Um, and I think that that's super exciting to see new designers given access to some of the larger conglomerates that can uh, sort of mentor and develop and give them that exposure. Really, everyone's success in life is really set up by the access they're given. And I think there's a more open conversation and more um, a conversation that's more on the forefront now on giving access to this environment. Um, so I just observed a number of these brands taking really thoughtful approaches on the way they're exciting the market and it's super dynamic. Great, thank you. 
Um, so uh, I'm going to sh shift gears a little bit, and we are getting a little tight on time. So I thought in this next question, I'll give you each a piece of the question, um, and then that way we can move through a, a little bit and make sure we get to all the content we wanted to get to. So obviously, it's, it's very easy to talk about our successful moments, um, but we've always we've all had moments of you know adversity and difficulty uh, within our careers that ultimately probably made us more successful than we would have been without them. So, um, you know, we sort of want to hear about some defining moments, maybe a mistake that you made along the way or a misstep that you experienced that became a real, you know, sort of teachable moment for you. Um, so why don't we start with um, Hildy? What's the toughest feedback you received from a boss? I would say the toughest feedback I received is actually, I don't know, say it was really scary moment for me pretty early on in my career at Vogue and I prided myself on being very organized and there was something I can't I don't want to reveal too many details so I'm not going really to tell you the names but it's like I but I will say this does not relate to Anna um so for those they're wondering um I made a mistake I screwed up someone's seating I didn't I think they didn't know they were supposed to be somewhere when they were and there were a lot of high powered people there and I made a mistake. I mean, I think I'm owning it. I made a mistake. It's also, you know, there were people in her office who didn't make maybe say where they were supposed to be. And, you know, but it was on me, fell on me. And as I was the one in charge of this event and making sure that this person got there, they were very angry. And I apologized. And I think I didn't realize how angry they were and they tried to have me fired. And that scared the crap out of me. And I think, you know, I was shocked that they were that angry about it or that they took it that seriously. And look, it's uh, of course, and I think that lesson, I wasn't fired. Um, I worked very hard to repair that relationship, you know, I personally, and I think what I learned from that is as comfortable or confident as you feel in a role because you think you're doing great, something can happen out of the blue that shakes your confidence and you have to really both be more, make sure you're as diligent as possible and also realize and live in that discomfort, which is very, was hard, was very hard for me. Um, took me a while to get over that, but also that you don't know how other people are gonna take things. And while I might not have, if, my sh if I were in this other person's shoes, I might not have taken it that seriously or that I might not have felt that seriously about it to have someone fired, but she did. And that's her right. She was the boss, uh, you know, was, you know, in a leadership position. So really, even if you don't agree with their reaction, it's their reaction and you have to live sort of with it within reason, obviously. And so really when things don't go your way, even if it's out, maybe you feel like it's a little overblown, you have to work within that construct. And I didn't like it. I wasn't happy about it. I was very scared, but I did. And I, so I think that that, and I didn't give up. You know what I mean? I didn't leave. I didn't want to leave. I loved my job. Um, so it's hard. It makes it hard. But that was sort of, I think that's the toughest feedback I think I've received. Okay, great. Thank you. I appreciate your candor. Um, okay, so uh, Morgan, how about uh, what do you wish you knew 10 years ago? Mm, that's a great question. Um, uh, I think, okay, the notion that uncertainty never goes anywhere. Uncertainty is not going anywhere. You might feel more or less of it at various stages. But uncertainty is always at play in life, in business. So the earlier in life you can accept what you can't control, the better. I think that I probably would have, uh, I was one to, and am, to really put in a lot of time into my work. But probably in my earlier years, I would have spent a few lesser 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. days if I had been able to understand or grasp what I couldn't control and put a little less time on those things. Um, but yeah, it's something I think just time develops, just sort of the confidence to grasp uncertainty and exist within it. Okay, great, thank you, Morgan. 
Okay, and Jim, um, anything you, you wish you'd done differently in your career? Um, I, I don't like to speak about regrets because I think that everything that you do brings you to a different place and you learn from it. So I think as long as you're like very self-aware of what you're getting out of each experience, um, like every experience has value. Um, I didn't particularly love being apart from my then partner, now husband for two years working at Zara. I was in a different country from him and that was really hard, but at the same time, it definitely made our relationship stronger. And I learned so much from that professional experience. Um, so I think as long as you're learning from your experiences, you are self-aware to know, like if something's not working for you to get out of that situation. And if you're viewing your career holistically as more of a jungle gym than a ladder, um, I think it's hard to take um, the wrong, like make the wrong decision. I mean, I'm sure there are more right decisions than others, but um, not to put that pressure on yourself because I think it's really, it's really hard, especially earlier in your career. Is this the right job for me? Is this, am I doing, is this gonna line me up to do the next thing? Um, and I just don't think there is one true path for everyone. There are multiple paths that can bring you to multiple really wonderful places. Great, thank you. So you guys have shared a lot of uh, great wisdom and, and advice here today. I uh, just wanted to ask you a couple of questions with some parting advice. So we'll do the same thing. I'll ask you uh, each one piece of it. So um, Morgan, uh, what are the attributes you look for when hiring new employees? Um, let's see, uh, self-awareness, enthusiasm, um, attention to detail. Um, those three are the most specific early on, of course, with more senior positions, the experience and the role. But honestly, even so, I try to take, I try to really measure those three quali qualities beyond it, because if you're sharp, if you're smart, if you really care, have that attention to detail, you really can pretty much learn almost any business. And so many skills are transferable. So I think that uh, that self-awareness is a really important piece. And also a sense of someone's, you know, honesty and candor and just how mm -hmm. they've treated other life situations and their integrity. Great, great. Um, so Jim, how about some advice on the best way to network? The best way to network, um, well, the blunt response is just, you have to do it, even if it's uncomfortable, like meet as many people as you possibly can and force yourself to cross the room and introduce yourself to someone. Um, once you've done the hard part of making that introduction, the actually more important part is staying in touch with them um, and sending the follow-up note um, and not just the follow-up note after you meet them, but six months later, when you read in WWD that this person did something interesting or their company did something interesting, a one-line email saying, hey, I saw this and thought of you, hope you're doing well. You don't have to write them uh, you know, a huge missive on why what they did was cool, but it's just staying top of mind. And I think if you can stay top of mind with a lot of people, that's the benefit of a, a really great network. Okay, great, thank you. And Hildy, what do you think is the best way to prepare for a job interview? I think you're on mute. Sorry about that, read okay. a lot, read up, you know, study, really think about, read about the person, the company, other things that have happened, make sure you, you know, you look as much as you can in the news about, you know, not just what happened recently, but what happened months ago, learn about where they're going, I would also say come prepared with how your experience can help them solve problems, you know, and I agree exactly with what Morgan said. It's all about the attitude too. And that, you know, what you don't take yourself too seriously that you really, you know, you want to take the job seriously. You're open, you're eager, you're ready to learn. I think sort of thinking about that also, uh, again, I'm sort of the weird person. I rarely, I hadn't been on a job interview until I applied for Condé. Like in politics, there are no interviews. So I might, there might probably others on this panel who can answer that question more accurately. But um, I would just say, I look, when I meet people, I look for someone who's engaging and flexible. And I will add quickly. Sure. Ask please, please. If yeah. you don't have a question at the end of the interview, um, 
like there's nothing that turns me off more than a person's lack of curiosity um, about the business, about the person. Like there are always questions to ask at the end of an interview. So if you don't have anything to say, then that shows to me that you're not really Great point. interested in the job. Yep, very yeah. good point. Well, thank you all very much. You've been an amazing, amazing <laughs> panel. I, I learned a few things from you too. So thank you for that. I think I'm gonna turn it over to Peter and we're gonna to go to some questions, right? Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. Uh, we've got a few that have come in and I will pose them to maybe the four of you, Jennifer, if you don't mind uh, also answering if, if they relate to something you'd wanna share. Uh, from Emily Keene, are there any areas of the industry you would still wanna explore later in your career? Just jump in anybody on these. I think beauty and wellness is really interesting. Um, I've been in the apparel industry my entire career, but it's a very complicated one. And it might be nice at some time to have fewer products and more um, <laughs> marketing and distribution conversations versus um, ephemeral products that are very hard to manufacture. <laughs> so I think that could be one area uh, personally that I'd be interested in. Thanks. Anybody else? All right, I'm going to jump to, this is for Morgan Hildy and you, Jennifer, as women in the industry, have you ever encountered any additional obstacles in your professional career? What was the experience like? What did you learn from it? How did you overcome it? Okay, so I, I would say, um, you know, for me, the biggest challenge was uh, balancing being a mother and, and working. And, um, I, you know, I think, uh, I, it, it didn't stop anything, but it but it definitely felt like it was a lot of very important priorities um, to to juggle and um, you know figuring out you know having a good plan for how for how you're going to do that what what's important in your in your lifestyle to to balance the the two things it's it's absolutely not impossible to do I mean I was a single mom of twins for a lot of my career and. And um, you know, manage to do it, but it's a challenge because you know your career is important to you, and you feel passionately about it. And the kids, the kids are the loves of, loves of your life, so um, you kind of want to you know figure out how to do both very, very well. So that for me, I would say was probably my biggest challenge. Nice, Hildy Morgan. Any? I would agree completely with Jennifer. I just to say, yes, certainly I have two children as well, younger children, and. Um, in politics as well as in fashion, I think that it isn't impossible, but I, some, I have felt consistently sometimes that the places I've worked don't really understand or make time or allowance for it. Like I had a newborn and on a presidential campaign, which, and I was the only senior leader who had a young child. And I said, I, we always did nightly calls. And I was like, I'll get on a call anytime you want, but please not between 6.30 and 7.30. It's my only time I will be back after. Like, And inevitably nine times out of 10, the call was between 6.30 and 7.30. So it's like, and you don't want to miss out. So you, you know, it's like you make, or you miss out. And I think that that was a really hard thing to juggle. And the only thing I would add also is that, you know, women, need to support women. And I think that sometimes that doesn't always happen. And I think that um, there are so many pioneers who were the first ones there and we need to make sure that they're, we're looking back and bringing other women up with us. Nice, thanks Hildy. Morgan, anything you'd wanna to add to that? Couldn't agree with Hildy more. Okay. <laughs> um, this is from Marco Martinez. Uh, can you describe a moment where you lost inspiration or motivation or perhaps lost your way? You, you guys have all talked about um, you know, your past, none of which were especially linear, um, but, but how did you find your footing again if you felt that you'd lost your way? I can speak to that as um, a startup founder. Like I think there are many moments where it can be really frustrating. Um, you want things to always grow in a super linear way and you work so hard to make things happen. And sometimes when they don't, it can be really frustrating and you don't have anyone else to lean on. So for me, what's been really important, um, especially in the last seven years running a, a small business um, and building it, 
is to have a network of people around me that, that I can call who can like get me motivated again. And so, so much of it, honestly, is just not feeling alone. And like, this is the first time this has ever happened to anybody. Um, because when you're, when you're running something, you feel like, oh, I personally have failed. And then I call friends who are doing the same thing. And they're like, this is just what's happening in the world right now. Or this happens to everybody. Like, we're all getting through this together. And I think that um, community aspect, especially in the fashion industry, um, which has like a really great community around it, um, has been super helpful to kind of get me through those uh, moments of frustration. Nice, nice. Anybody else on that one? I'm gonna get a little granular here. Um, as you look back on your careers, a course you wish you'd studied in college that would have helped you. <laughs> Had you, had you taken it? I read contracts almost every day of my life. So any sort of like legal background um, would be helpful. Um, the other thing is negotiations. I negotiate literally every day of my life. So um, I think those are two good skills to have and courses that I did not take in my academic career. Nice, thanks. I would, I would add, um, particularly in this era with the growth of the digital channel across really every industry. Uh, any course you can take on the digital business and its development that I weren't even really available to us when we were in school <laughs> is one to jump on because that's um, the huge, most pivotal part of really every industry, especially with all these conversations around the metaverse and you, this is a whole, it is moving fast. Yeah, super, exactly. We'll be having this panel next year in the metaverse, probably. <laughs> probably. Um, I would agree. I would say um, I really wish I took more business courses, um, especially marketing, straight PL. Like I took economics, obviously, as like an intro in college, but I was a poli sci and women's studies major. I wish I had much stronger of a business background, even if I never used it. I think that um, so many people and anyone out there who is thinking about starting their own label, I would urge you to have that business foundation, even if you never do it and hopefully hire an amazing partner to run the business side for you while you be creative, but you need to have that understanding. And I, I wish I did. Nice. Thanks, Lily. Um, Time for one more from Michaela Parker. I'll do the sort of rapid fire to each of, of the four of you. Best advice you've received so far in your career, personal or professional? And then this could be advice you might want to impart right now in closing to, to our audience. Uh, Jennifer. Okay, so mine would be similar to uh, what Morgan said, which is that uh, you know no one will ever remember what you said or did, but they will always remember how you made them feel. And that's the way that I try to lead every day and um, was probably the best advice that I ever got early in my career. Thanks, Jennifer. Jim. I would say take a deep breath. Um, nothing is as, hopefully nothing is as scary as it seems. Um, and sometimes you need to like take a step back um, to put things into context. Um, on a very practical level, it means like if you need to leave the office and even that commute, by the time you get home, it can be less scary of a problem. So I think sometimes you just need to cut yourself off and get a fresh perspective um, because yeah, you don't want your head to go into all sorts of crazy places. <laughs> uh, Morgan? Um, when you're trying to make a decision, um, think about the primary question you're asking yourself, and that'll tell you about your attitude in that moment. So meaning is the primary question, what if this doesn't work? Or is the primary question you're asking yourself, what if this does? And I find that in moments of stress or um, a little frustration, we think, well, this won't work. This might not work. But in moments that you're more content, you have a little bit more optimism. So always maybe distance yourself from a decision you have to make. Think about what your, you know, inside of you, what, which question are you really asking before you make the decision? So you make it with clarity um, and based on the facts. Thanks, Morgan. That was so well put. The only final word from you in terms of advice you received or want to give. Oh, you're muted. Sorry. I mean, honestly, all of that is incredible advice. So I, I agree with all of that. So I, I would just say, have fun and do what you love and do it well. 
and be passionate about it because that's, you know, your time is so valuable. So spend it doing something you enjoy. Great. That brought a smile to my face. So thank you <laughs> for that. And Morgan and, and James, thank you so much. And Jennifer for moderating. This was, as expected, a really, really meaningful session. So very grateful to the four of you for making it. So thanks very, very much. And um, hope to see you all soon in the audience at the next session. Thanks again, everybody. Right. Thank you. Thank bye you, guys. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.